Dear child of God, which Catholic teaching confuses you? The rosary? When we pray to Jesus indirectly through Mary, we simply imitate God. Because God spoke to the Virgin Mary indirectly through the Archangel Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 from verse 26 to 28. So pray your rosary. Or oh, Mary not having other children after Jesus. In Mark chapter 6 verse 3, James, Joseph, Simon and Jude mentioned there were not blood brothers of Jesus. Yes, because the Holy Bible never called them sons of Joseph or the children of Mary. In fact, the Holy Bible never told us that Mary had a second, third or fourth pregnancy after the birth of Jesus. Or Catholics bowing before holy statues and images. If Joshua laid prostrate before the Ark of the Old Covenant in Joshua chapter 7 verse 6, then I can bow before the holy statue of Mary, who is the Ark of the New Covenant. Meet Bro Raymond weekly on the CD of Immaculata for his best-selling book, videos, and audio CDs. Please call plus 234-818-423-0876 or meet him on his YouTube channel, Immaculata Media. Hello, brothers and sisters. Today's talk dwells on why Roman Catholics bow before man-made statues and images. You're welcome to the city of Immaculata. Let us examine the accusation leveled against Catholics in their use of holy statues and images. Roman Catholics are accused of idolatry whenever they make the sign of the cross or bow before a holy crucifix or statue of the Virgin Mary or Jesus or other holy saints or whenever they kiss or venerate the holy crucifix during Easter or even venerate the relics of saints. The accusation comes, idolatry. Let us reason with the scriptures. Notice that those who wish to accuse Roman Catholics of idolatry normally start with um, quoting Exodus, the book of Exodus chapter 20 from verse 3 to 5. So we shall divide that passage into two in order to get the message clearer. The first part is from verse 3 to 4, Exodus chapter 20 from verse 3 to 4, which says, Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not make to thyself a graven thing, nor the likeness of anything in heaven, above, or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. Close quote. When people read this passage, they make two misinterpretations, simply because they read the Bible literally. Some will tell you that uh, <clears throat> that passage means that Christians should not make signs like the Catholic um, sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. No, you shouldn't make it. Others will tell you that this passage means that you should not produce or have any holy pictures, statues, relics, or sacramentals for any reason at all. This includes the statues of Jesus or Mary or other saints. Let me give you my first correction. My first point of view. You see, in Exodus chapter 20, from verse 1 to 4, it, the Bible does not forbid the making of the sign of the cross because... If it were a crime, if it were wrong to make signs, then God may be guilty because he first made use of sign in Genesis chapter 9 from verse 12 to 17. The sign of the rainbow to help him remember not to destroy the world with flood again. Now, if God, who can never forget, now needs the sign of the rainbow to help him remember, then you need the sign of the cross to put to mind the reality of the Holy Trinity and also remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Recall that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So I ask you, if Jesus wants you to carry your cross daily and follow him, why should he get angry when you make the sign of the cross? That cross which he wants you to carry daily is not possible. He will be happy to see you make it. The second correction is, for this category of Christians who claim that God forbade the making and the use of images or relics, I think they are wrong. Is it because if it were wrong to make images or statues or to respect holy relics, then we should ask God first. My reason is that we have at least images of our past leaders and heroes on our currencies, and we use this to give arms in our churches. Confirm what I'm saying now, if you have some money on you, you may see the image of someone, probably your country's past leader or any other national hero. And so you, you use this money with somebody's image on it to give arms in churches without any qualms of conscience. 
We also have pictures and icons and statues of our loved ones in our houses, vehicles, offices, etc. And we find nothing wrong with this. But then, even God made an image of himself with clay in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and Genesis chapter 2 from verse 6 to 7 when he said, quote, Let us make man in our own image and likeness. God went further to directly and personally order the making of images on at least two occasions. The first one is from Exodus chapter 25 from, from 10 to 21, where God ordered the making of the Ark of the Covenant with setting wood and also asked the Israelites to make statues or images of two angels with pure gold. But it didn't end there. He still asked them to place the statues of the angels on each end of the Ark. Still, it didn't end there. God made the ark so sacrosanct and powerful that he killed a man who touched it illegally in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7. This same ark became so powerful that David, King David, refused to keep it in his house. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, from verse 9 to 10. Imagine. God, who said in Exodus chapter 20, from verse 3 to 5, that his people should not make the likeness of anything in heaven, now commands them to make the statue that resembles angels who are in heaven. Also go to Numbers chapter 21 from verse 6 to 9 and see where God ordered the making of a snake statue with a bronze, with bronze. But it didn't end there. God still ordered his people to look at the bronze serpent for healing from snake poisoning. Notice from the examples shown so far that God insisted that the statues must be made of durable metals. The statues of angels were made of pure gold and that of snake made of pure bronze. God was not surely joking. So from Exodus chapter 25 from verse 10, 10 to 21 and Numbers 21 from verse 8 to 9, it is clear that Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 to 5, there God did not literally mean that Christians should not make statues or images at all. No. So what did God forbid in Exodus chapter 20 from verse 3 to 5? What? What God forbids is contained in the, in the second part of that passage. That is verse 5, Exodus chapter 20 verse 5, where the Bible says, Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. God said, Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. And some Bible versions will tell you, Thou shalt not bow down before them. And some versions will also read, Thou shalt not worship them. All these point to one instruction, which is, Don't ever give the adoration or worship, which is proper for God alone, to any created thing, whether a carved image or an even human being. But at this point, we need to ask ourselves, what makes an act of adoration or worship proper for God alone? What form of worship belongs to God alone? Is it the singing of praises? No, because you can still sing the praises of the world footballer of the year. And even the Israelites sang the praise of King David when he killed Goliath and God did not take offense. So singing of praises is not an act of worship kept for God alone, no. Is it the act of kneeling or bowing before a superior? No. Because in Genesis chapter 42, verse 6, Joseph's brothers bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Yet God did not take offense. The type of worship meant for God alone is called lateral worship or supreme worship. And there's one powerful way of knowing lateral worship. You see, in lateral worship, the worshiper regards whoever is being worshipped as his or her God or creator or maker. Once the worshiper sees what is being worshipped as God, then we call it supreme worship. And such worship is meant for God alone. But if a Christian honors a superior without regarding the superior as God, then lateral worship has not been done. Remember, the sin of idolatry is committed once the worshiper clearly regards what, what he or she is worshipping as God, when that thing is not God. On two occasions, the Israelites looked up to a man-made object or statues in order to get some good results. On one occasion, God healed them, and on another occasion, God punished them. Yet, on both occasions, they looked up to man-made objects, hoping to get favors. Now, let us investigate the occasion where the Israelites looked up to a man-made statue and God blessed them instead of getting angry with the practice. We'll find this in Numbers chapter 21, from verse 8 to 9, quote, The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is beaten can look at it and leave. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. 
Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Close quote. Why did God not get angry? Why did God bless them for looking up to a man-made statue of snake for healing? Why? I will tell you the answer. The reason is that when they looked at the bronze serpent, the Bible did not tell us that they regarded the statue of the, the, the statue of the serpent as their god at that point in time. Remember, practical idol worship is an act, tangible or intangible, where you consciously regard a being or an object as God when that being is not God. So in this case, the Bible did not tell us that when they looked at the statue for healing, that they regarded it as their creator or their God. So they did not worship idol by looking at the bronze serpent. Get the difference. They looked, but they did not consciously regard it as their God. Now let us investigate another occasion where the Israelites looked up to a man-made statue and God got angry. We shall then find out why. We find this in Exodus chapter 32 from verse 4 to 6. Quote, he took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got to indulge in revelry. This is idolatry because in this case, they consciously worshipped and referred to the golden calf as their god. Get the difference? But in the case of the bronze serpent, when they looked at it, they did not see it as their god. They received healing from God. Rather, you need to be aware that much later, actually, the Israelites started worshipping the bronze serpent as their god in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, and it became a sin unto them. Because consciously, they regarded it as their God. But initially, when they did not do it, God blessed them. God did not get angry with them. He healed them, as a matter of fact. So when you consciously take what is not God to be God, idol worship occurs. In Exodus chapter 20, from verse 1 to 5, God summarily was saying, Do not take or regard as your God what is not God. Period. Forget about making of images and all that. Look. Consider a newly married man on honeymoon. At times when his wife is not there in the house, he kisses the wife's picture affectionately. I'm sure you know that by doing so, he does not commit any idolatry because even though he kissed the wife's picture, which is actually a painted piece of paper, affectionately, his mind remains and remains on his wife consciously or even unconsciously. A certain man would even look at the wife's picture directly and say, I love you. I can boldly tell you that he did all the looking at the wife's picture, but his mind was on his real wife proper. When the man kisses his wife's picture, you may only accuse him of idolatry if on kissing the wife's picture, his mind goes to his wife and regards his wife as his God. Get it? But if the man kisses the wife's picture and his mind transcends with love to his real wife only as his wife, no problems. No idolatry. Again, consider another peculiar example. If Mr. President salutes our national flag on our Armed Forces Remembrance Day, for instance, he surely does not salute a piece of painted, piece of, uh, uh, painted cloth. No. He honors our past heroes and the entire country. Even though his body acts towards the flag, his mind rests on the entire country and her past heroes, consciously or unconsciously. It is wrong to accuse him of idolatry simply because he seemingly saluted a painted piece of cloth. No. The question is this. As he is saluting the flag, where is his mind? The answer is that his mind is on the entire country and her past heroes, especially those who sacrificed their lives for our country. You can only accuse Mr. President of idolatry if he salutes the national flag and either perceives this flag as his god, or perceives the country or her fallen heroes as real gods. But that is not the case. The president salutes the national flag strictly in honor of our country and her heroes, and he sees them as heroes and not as gods. So there is no idolatry there. What am I saying? Look, if I bow before the holy statue of the Virgin Mary, 
My spirit rests on the Virgin Mary, really, just like a man who kissed his wife's picture and his mind spiritually touches his real wife. If I bow before the Holy, Holy Statue of Virgin Mary, you can only accuse me of idolatry if my mind, on transcending to the person of the Virgin Mary, consciously perceives her as my God. But that is never the case. Check it everywhere. If I bow before the Holy Statue of Mary and my mind rests on the person of the Virgin Mary as my intercessor and not as my God, then there is no problem. Remember, idolatry occurs once you consciously regard or see what you are worshipping as God when that thing is not truly God. If our president bows before our national flag and his mind rests on the entire country's fallen heroes, as heroes, not as God, then all is well. If I kiss my wife's picture and my mind spiritually touches my wife as my wife and not as my God, all is well. If I bow before the Holy Statue of the Virgin Mary and my mind reaches out to the person of the Virgin Mary as Mary, my mother, the intercessor, as the mother of Jesus, but not as my God, all is well. Even if I wave at her statue, all is well. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 21, the woman of the issue of blood said to herself, if only I could touch his garment, I shall be healed. See, there are about four parallels we can draw from this passage in order to prove that Catholics do not commit idolatry when they venerate holy relics and statues of saints. Watch me. See, she intended to touch Christ's garment and not even his body in order to be healed. She knew very well that Christ's garment was not Christ and was not his body, just his garment. This is similar to a man who kisses or bows before the holy crucifix on Good Friday. He knows quite well that they, he kissed a carved piece of wood or even plastic and not the flesh of Christ. Yeah. But the Spirit of God inspired the woman to realize that an ordinary garment which comes in contact with the body of Jesus could become extraordinary and actually becomes extraordinary. Similarly, the man who bows before the Holy Crucifix on Good Friday, just like that lady, is inspired to realize that an ordinary crucifix like you're seeing now, had made extraordinary contact with our Lord by the blessing of the church through the hand of the priest and the power of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, which it depicts, and by the power of the Holy Trinity, which the cross depicts. The woman's body made a simple touch with Christ's garment, but her mind made a real grip on the person of Christ. And in the same way, the man who kissed the crucifix on Good Friday made a simple mouth touch on the holy statue of Jesus, but his mind made a real grip on the person of Christ. She did the touch on the body of Jesus. On touching the garment, the power of Jesus oozed out of his body. This is similar to a person that kisses the holy crucifix on Good Friday and Easter grace oozes out of Jesus. And just like the woman actually touched Jesus by faith, the man actually kissed Jesus on Good Friday by faith. Yes. So this is because he kissed the person of Christ spiritually. He kissed Jesus, I tell you. No idolatry. See, let us reason with the scriptures and common sense. Consider Numbers chapter 21 from verse 6 to 9. The Bible tells us that God commanded the Israelites who were beaten by live snakes to look at the bronze serpent in order to get healed. Now, when they looked, they knew that they were looking at an image made with bronze. They knew. Sure, they were elders and adults. Just as when I bow before the statue of Mother Mary, I know that it is probably made of ceramics. But if by looking at the bronze serpent, the sick Israelites connected with the healing spirit of God, then by bowing before the holy statue of Mary, I can connect spiritually to the intercession of the Virgin Mary, to the person of Mary. Even God, who commanded them to look at the bronze serpent, knew that it was man-made with bronze. God is knowledge himself. Yet, he asked them to look at the, the, the bronze serpent to get their healing. Something as ugly and as deadly as a serpent. The Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 7, verse 6, that Joshua rent his garments and fell flat on the ground before the ark of the Lord, the ark of the covenant, until evening, both he and the ancients of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. See, if you've seen the picture of the ark of the covenant before, you will imagine how serious Joshua's offense should have been. Yet God did not take offense. They did not just bow before the ark of the covenant. They fell prostrate. I mean, every man of every one of them, before a man-made structure, 
the Ark of the Covenant with the statues of angels on both extremes. Joshua knew that the Ark was man-made. He also knew that it had carved images of angels on it. Why then did he prostrate? Why then did he lie flat before the Ark of the Covenant when God said in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 to 5, you should not do so? If you can understand why Joshua bowed before the, the man-made object, then you will understand why I can bow before the holy statue of Jesus or Mary, knowing fully well that such is man-made. Holy one as that, at that. But seriously, joke apart. Why did Joshua bow before the, before the... Why did he prostrate even before the Ark of the Covenant? I ask you why. It is because in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 15, Isaiah chapter 37, verse 16, Psalm 99 from verse 1 to 6, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2, Psalm 80, verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, tell us that God enthroned his glory in the middle of the ark, above and between the winged creatures. So even though God was everywhere, his glory dwelt specially within the ark. So when Joshua bowed, he knew that the ark was man-made, but he also knew that the Spirit of God had taken over. So he was actually relating to God. So if Joshua could bow before the ark of the covenant of the old, which was hallowed and was made potent by the presence of God, and God did not take offense, then I can bow before the holy statue of the Virgin Mary, who is the ark of the new covenant, and really honor Mary, and God will not complain. In fact, God will bless me. And God will bless me through her intercession. Check out what I'm saying. Let us prove our hard disks. Dear child of God, I hope you know that Joshua connected to God through a man-made structure, the Ark of the Covenant in Joshua chapter 7 verse 6. I hope you know that the Israelites connected to the healing power of God through a bronze serpent, the statue of a, a serpent in Numbers chapter 21 from verse 6 to 9. I hope you know and remember that the woman of the issue of blood connected to Jesus through his garment in Mark chapter 5 from verse 24 to 29. I hope you know that a blind man connected to Jesus through his saliva in John chapter 9 verse 6. Even the sick connected to St. Paul through ordinary handkerchiefs in Acts of the Apostles chapter 19 verse 11. The sick also connected to St. Peter, even the possessed, through his shadow in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 verse 15. If all this happened, who tells you that you cannot connect to Jesus through his holy crucifix or that you cannot connect to the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary through her holy image? You surely can. Let us look at more fruits of reason. Consider the statue of a snake as weighed as that could be. Keep it on one side and keep the statue of the Virgin Mary on another side. If you ask God, Lord, which one would you prefer to work miracles with? A snake statue or the Virgin Mary statue? Which one do you think God would choose? I ask you, which one? Is it the snake statue or the Virgin Mary statue? Surely, God will choose to work miracles with the statue of the Virgin Mary. But this brings us to the logical point here. If God worked miracles through the, through the statue of something as, well, weighed as a snake, as abnormal as the statue of a snake in Numbers chapter 21 from verse 6 to 9, he will do greater and unbelievable miracles through the holy statue of Mary, the mother of Jesus, his mother, the true mother of his son. Also consider the ordinary soil. We have sandy soil, loamy soil, humus soil, and their combinations or hybrids. And you know that the soil contains bacteria, at times virus, and other forms of um, infectious matter. However, as filthy as the soil could be, the presence of God made it so holy that the, in Exodus chapter 3 from verse 2 to 5, to the extent that God asked Moses to remove his sandals because the ground became holy. So I ask you, if ordinary ground could become hallowed to the extent that God asked Moses to remove his sandals, how much more a holy statue of the Virgin Mary or holy crucifix? How much more? You know that the Ark of the Covenant is just a man-made structure made of wood, laden with pure gold, with statues of two angels at the extremes. Now look at what the Bible said about this Ark of the Covenant in Psalm 132 verse 8. It says, quote, Arise, O Lord, into thy resting place, thou and the Ark which thou hast sanctified. The Ark, man-made, sanctified. So the question is this, if God found an Ark of the Covenant so pleasing that he sanctified it, and he worked many powerful miracles, for Israel, through the ark, who tells you that God cannot sanctify the statue of the Virgin Mary and even work much more miracles? Let us take more pressing questions. In John chapter 9, verse 6, Jesus wanted to heal a blind man. 
But instead of directly or outrightly casting out the blindness, he used his saliva to form paste with dust with which he cured the blindness. This is simply to teach you, you and I, that God could empower nature at will and glorify himself through created objects. Let us ask ourselves, why did God empower the staff of Moses before giving the Israelites water in the desert in Exodus chapter 17 from verse 5 to 7? He had the power to bring out water directly from the rock at least, but he chose to empower the, the, the staff of Moses to show that he could use sacramental objects in solving problems which we expect him to solve directly and you know, ordinarily. Why did the prophet need to use salt to sanitize the river in 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 21? when ordinary prayer could have done it. Till date, this passage gives direct insight to the basis for the Catholic blessing of holy water, even with salt. This is all because God wanted to show the later importance of sacramental objects. You and I know that a captain in the army cannot honor a major general in the army by ordinary feelings of the heart. No, he needs to physically manifest the honor by saluting, not just in the heart. So to honor saints in heaven, we need to physically manifest such by bowing or waving or reverencing their relics and holy images. Yeah! Some Christians insist that the remains of the holy saints are useless and should not be venerated the way Roman Catholics venerate the great saints and their remains, you know, the relics who are confirmed to be in heaven. But I ask you, if the body of a great saint became useless, or becomes useless after death. Why was it that in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21, the dead bones of Prophet Elisha revived a dead man? It was because God chose to make Prophet Elisha's remains powerful, even after his soul had left his body. If you think that the body of a holy saint becomes worthless after death, why was it that Mary Magdalene and co. wanted to anoint the body of Jesus with spices in Mark chapter 16, verse 1? They should have said that his body was useless after all he had yielded his spirit. So please, I urge you to look into the Catholic veneration of images. I thank you for watching and goodbye. God bless you.